Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Connecting Dots podcast. As usual I'm your host Osama and today on behalf of the Connecting Dots team we're very excited to be bringing you this episode which is centered around the aviation business. Our today's guest is none other than Mohammed Tahir but you might know him from the title of the airport guy on social media. So without further ado let's get started. Mohammed first of all thank you so much for being here with us and uh, how had your day been so far? Thank you Osama. Really good spending time with my family, done a bit of shopping. and i've been looking forward to this amazing amazing thank you very much so let's get started first of all uh, mohammed i can clearly i have your linkedin open right now and i can see you've done a bunch of things <laughs> being at heathrow <laughs> for a couple of years here so give us an uh, a brief elevator pitch about your professional journey so far and uh, how had your experience been with specifically uh, heathrow okay so Um I guess my my journey into into Heathrow started before Heathrow so it's worth just touching upon what I done before Heathrow. Um I studied aerospace engineering as you mentioned mm-hmm. and during my degree I had something called a placement year mm-hmm. where I worked at Lufthansa Technik uh, mm-hmm. which is actually a place that overhauls landing gear for aircraft. So if you imagine when an airplane is coming into land those big multi mm-hmm. bulky metal things underneath it we take those we put them in a factory environment mm-hmm. we rip them apart and put them all back together again in that environment my okay. job was to find continuous improvement it was to find efficiencies in the process mm-hmm. it was to make that place run like clockwork and what i discovered about myself was i absolutely loved problem solving on that level how can i make things more efficient how can i make things better mm-hmm. so if you imagine a factory environment yeah. where i did that for an entire year i i designed a jig mm-hmm. that would hold the landing gear for a Boeing 737 till this day they still use that so every time a Boeing oh, nice. 737 goes through their mm-hmm. uh goes through their factory facility they use this jig and this jig wasn't like any other mm-hmm. jig in the facility it was it actually used to hold the landing mm-hmm. gear from the inside rather than holding it from the outside this introduced multiple mm-hmm. different efficiencies because okay. it wouldn't block the way of the engineers while they were working on it point being mm-hmm. i loved continuous improvement mm-hmm. while i was there graduated finished and then I joined Heathrow Airport mm-hmm. now if you think that the factory environment for Lufthansa is interesting mm-hmm. you step into an airport and all of a sudden mm-hmm. you see so much things that could be improved mm-hmm. so many different things that you can apply that same continuous improvement mindset to and absolutely level it up i yeah. i joined on the graduate program and the beauty of a graduate program is it has a rate mm-hmm. rotational nature so i every 6 months i rotated between different departments I spent 6 months looking after the terminal buildings, 6 6 months in the baggage system mm-hmm. where I was actually making the process more efficient to make sure the bags are flowing through the system more efficiently. I spent 6 months in the rail department, 6 mm-hmm. months in the air side infrastructure looking after the runways and taxiways. And I I kept jumping around yeah. from one place to another. By the end of it, I got asked which of those mm-hmm. places do you want to specialize in? and i absolutely loved being outside by the aircraft okay. on the runways taxiways so i chose to specialize yeah. in that that's where i became the system specialist with the aerodrome mm-hmm. at heathrow airport so that's a little bit about my journey uh so mohammed other, other than that um i was uh, i was curious enough to uh you know i was wondering about the fact that um what is it about aviation that really keeps you interested and if we specifically centered the conversation around this uh, modern day wonder which is called the Heathrow airport mm. um what is it about it that keeps you motivated every day and you know you're happy you you create good content and you're just you f- by the looks of your content you feel satisfied so what is it that keeps you going when you walk around Heathrow airport you'll realize that it's a gift that keeps on giving there's always something going on it's so dynamic it's such a beast right it's huge um and when you when you're walking around you realize mm-hmm. when you're looking after the engineering in a place that's that dynamic with mm-hmm. so many different factors that change and adapt there's always something to dig your teeth into to try and understand the problem and understand the root mm-hmm. cause of the problem and just like that understanding mm-hmm. problems is one thing but also finding improvements is another thing so there's th- the same way i used to walk around yeah. the factory floor to look for improvements when i'm at heathrow mm-hmm. airport every time i'm looking around i'm looking for improvements there's constantly mm-hmm. something that could be done better um and i absolutely mm-hmm. love that about heathrow mm-hmm. airport um the people is one other thing that really really i love about working at heathrow airport you may think yeah technical engineering all of that is great but Heathrow Airport is ultimately mm-hmm. a selection of almost 75,000 people who all come together to make people 
fly and take off and get to their destinations on on time mm-hmm. and i love learning about these different people and learning mm-hmm. about all the different pieces of the puzzle that come together to make heathrow airport operate this is mm-hmm. what i really love about airports in general specifically mm-hmm. heathrow is that not mm-hmm. one person is can can be removed and the thing will run like clockwork it is a complete team effort to make people go on holiday there's there's not one person that's dispensable we all have to come together to make this thing work nice that's that's very nice to know about that that it's not really uh, a one person show but rather it's a it's a dynamic team team effort that a lot of people from different departments they come together mm. and then as a result we see this entire system operating um so in in a similar perspective um i've been very curious to know about uh the fact that if like okay let let me put it this way for an airport it has a finite um uh i would say real estate mm-hmm. so like you have a finite number of runways that are operational right. and considering the amount of traffic that these kind of airports get sometimes let's say if there were to be god forbid there were to be an emergency and you guys have to quickly m- make sure that the plane can land and everything but then while that plane is occupying the space on the runway there there are like three other planes waiting to be landed right mm. so all in all how does this work work out i've been very fascinated to know about that that how do you guys make sure that the traffic gets rerouted uh and the emergency is always prioritized so that's a very good question and it's it's one thing that you don't realize before joining an airport but there are people whose job it is to specialize in contingency planning contingency planning is a fancy way of saying mm-hmm. what do we do when things don't go to plan and what plan do we have mm-hmm. that can that we can activate as soon as something goes wrong and we need to we need to fix it so for example if there ever was an emergency we press a we press like a, a metaphorical button mm-hmm. and there are people who could be at home there mm-hmm. on their day off within 90 minutes they have to be at the airport mm-hmm. straight away So if anything happens oh, we okay. have a group of okay. people who are on standby yeah. constantly to deal with any emergencies. So instantly you have the resource available uh-huh. and they have the headspace that their only job at the airport today is to try and get this issue solved. That's step one. When they step into the situation mm-hmm. there was somebody else who for the past mm-hmm. couple of years and my friend is doing this currently his job is to think of the worst case scenario okay. of something that might happen and write a plan of what we can do if mm-hmm. that does happen and he won't write that plan by himself he'll go to mm-hmm. the subject matter expert on the ground okay. and he will sit down with a meeting with him one to one and they will get down on paper exactly what we are going to do if something was not to go wrong and that is in case of an emergency if there's an aircraft that crashes or if it's the if one day the lights mm-hmm. all the electricity electrical supply switches off one day and we don't have any more electricity or mm-hmm. if maybe one of the tunnels was to collapse yeah. or if what there was a, a road traffic uh-huh. accident any anything mm-hmm. <laughs> this this colleague in particular he's written on his desk on his laptop he's written if it's real <laughs> and it could happen plan for yeah. it <laughs> he's yeah. got that on his desk like okay. if it's not as long as it's not imaginary <laughs> and it might happen yeah. let's have a plan yeah. in place to make sure that when that does yeah. happen we can overcome yeah. it so even before the ac- emergency has actually yeah. happened you'll see how much has happened behind the scenes mm-hmm. that are preparing just in case yeah. something was to happen now your question was more specifically yeah. about where do we reroute the airports now luckily um we have two runways So mm-hmm. if there was ever to be a, an issue mm-hmm. with one of the runways we always have another runway that we could utilize. So if there was an emergency aircraft and we wanted to land mm-hmm. it on one airplane, we wanted to land it on let's say the northern mm-hmm. runway, mm-hmm. we can always just continue mm-hmm. the rest of the operation although at a slower pace on the southern runway. So we could yeah. go to single runway operations. That was in worst case scenario something's happened on that northern runway. One thing uh-huh. you need to realize about Heathrow Airport is that right. even if something quite catastrophic may happen there are our, our mm-hmm. goal as long as safety is 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 uh is controlled is to try and keep the operation mm-hmm. moving. So we will contain the issue yeah. in one place and then we will try to keep the operation mm-hmm. moving. There will never be a time where 
well there could mm. be a time but we hope not you know god forbid there's a time where we just have to shut down completely yeah, even if yeah. we can only keep 5% of the airport running we will do our best to keep 5% of the airport mm. running because there's that those 5% of people yeah. don't need to be affected by the emergency so the mm. the the people's brains are ticking in the background way ahead of time to see yeah. what we could do and that's the thing i really love about heathrow as a brand as well that I have a, to a certain degree I I have a little bit of contentment that if there were to be if there were anything to to be going wrong here I I believe that the staff is competent enough and is responsible enough to understand the situation mm-hmm. and react promptly to it so so the passengers can have a peace of mind and they can continue with their journeys and uh, yeah yeah that's the thing I really admire about Heathrow yeah uh, that, that definitely and I can I can guarantee um, that that is the case that's exactly what's happening on our end we're trying to do our best to make sure that the the service is not compromised. Yeah. Um Mohammed other other than that uh when your content creation journey started and you started making videos sometimes when you work for organizations there are certain de- degree of privacy you have to seek approvals before posting literally anything online. So although your uh, your videos your content is very educative it's very informative and it's very cool to be honest as well it's worth watching. Uh so when your content creation journey started Did you go through any hoops any did you seek any approvals or or did you just you know start posting stuff and then it it became a phenomena To be honest with you when I joined Heathrow Airport they told me mm-hmm. something they said we joined on the graduate program right so we came full of fresh ideas and new ideas mm-hmm. um and the person who hired us told yeah. me something gave me a piece of advice he's like Mohammed with a company this big mm-hmm. If you try and mm. jump through the, all the hoops before you do something you you will never ever yeah. action it because there's so much process to go through. So he said, "Muhammad, don't ask for permission. Right. Ask for forgiveness." Yeah. And I I heard that and I was like, that's genius. Uh-huh. Like right. don't ask for for, for, yeah. for permission, ask yeah. for forgiveness. Worst case scenario, you mess up. You do something <laughs> wrong and it yeah. goes wrong. Ask for forgiveness. Say I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. I'll learn from my mistake. But if you if you ask for permission every single time, then you'll never ever actually get something mm-hmm. done. So I took that in mind and I ran with it. I started to I I I, I educated myself <laughs> about what the red lines are, security processes, yeah. um, mm-hmm. you know some some mm-hmm. information I can't even mention because just by mentioning it, I've I've yeah. removed the the uh, you know I've I've, done, I've gone across the line. There's a lot of information that I I Correct. completely yeah. steer away from. but within the other confines mm-hmm. there's so much information that's already readily available mm-hmm. online so i started to make content about that i started to mm-hmm. make content about the stuff that's already online and i just started to upload and upload and upload and upload and upload and two years mm-hmm. went by and i'd have like one or two colleagues yeah. that knew of me doing this stuff and some people mm-hmm. told me don't do it but mm-hmm. i just done it anyway um and then i started to get messages yeah. from strangers saying mo like your content so beneficial i've i've really really learned so much and then i started yeah. to get people applying for jobs at heathrow and saying i only applied because of your page uh-huh. and what what i started to do is i started to get a positive feedback loop of this content and i started to present that back mm-hmm. to senior management right i started to say well look like yeah i've only got yeah. like 4000 followers online and the page is still not that big but look people are actually benefiting mm-hmm. from this content and it hit a critical yeah. mass where when it did blow up mm-hmm. and like it, it went like huge yeah. now yeah. i get people that walk through the airport that work there who say yo man i love your videos keep it up and i don't even know who they are like <laughs> like every, yeah. almost yeah. every single time i go to the airport now yeah somebody from the operational uh-huh. staff or from a passenger would tap me on the shoulder mm-hmm. and say yo man i love your mm-hmm. videos keep it up so it's got to that point where yeah. now even the pr team the yeah. social media team they start discussing like the stuff yeah. that i'm doing in their meetings and i have no idea right but i didn't ask for any permission <laughs> i didn't ask for nice. any i just yeah. done it i just yeah. i just done it now i there's a process they mm-hmm. created a process just for me because if you look if you mm-hmm. add up the numbers on instagram yeah. and tiktok i've got more followers than the official heathrow page which is quite crazy <laughs> I, even when i say it it's just yeah. insane like <laughs> alhamdulillah right yeah um but now they've introduced yeah. the process because yeah. it's got to a point For where sure. they have to and the most heartwarming thing is 
you've not done it because you've considered that considered it as a job i mean what i mean is that in every single field out there even if someone were to become an astronaut there's a cool side of thing that motivated someone to go there but then there's a brunt work in that field mm. which nobody wants to do even any industry you take there's there's the cool work maybe which is few percentage yeah. and there's that brunt work and that is amazing that you've kept pushing you've kept going you didn't stop midway with whether you were at runway inspecting lights whether you were inspecting uh the the wheels of the aircraft whether you were telling us about how the ac works of an aircraft you've always made it sound so cool that even for the brunt work of the field it just felt like i want to be a part of it right and for that i think the community would definitely thank you for that and i think you you're already seeing you're seeing the the benefit or the, or the reward out of it and kudu kudos to you man for that definitely thank you bro um, i appreciate that yeah no no worries no worries uh other other than that i wanted to ask you about uh about your perception of the field before you've joined mm. uh because you've you joined when you were a student and you started working here you found your calling uh but were there any myths that got busted for you once you've started working yes When you're at university you assume that your technical understanding especially specifically as an engineer mm-hmm. is the thing that will make you stand out mm-hmm. how technically able you are how mm-hmm. smart you are um at the at the, the nitty gritty stuff mm-hmm. once you join any organization mm-hmm. you will quickly realize that your ability to communicate and articulate with your peers and work as a team far outweighs any technical mm-hmm. ability that you may have There are only a few jobs out there where your technical work and your technical ability mm-hmm. outweighs your human to human ability. Mm-hmm. And specifically if you want to go up to the top mm-hmm. and if you want to succeed in the term in in like the the corporate world, they don't the technical experts are yeah. the people who become the senior leaders. The leaders are the people who have the people skills, mm-hmm. the people who are able to communicate and articulate and connect with their team. That is the people who mm-hmm. go to the top. So that was a massive myth that was that was busted, right? I still go to schools and universities yeah. and the question I get asked is, "Oh, what software should I should I learn so that I can so that I can get the job?" And I'm like, yeah. "Bro, you, you don't need to learn any software." You know, you need to learn how to communicate and articulate yeah. yourself. And they're like, really? Yeah. I'm like, like, what books would you Absolutely. recommend for yeah. aerospace engineering? I'm like, I'd recommend How to Win Friends and Influence People. And they're like, what? But yeah. that's not an engineering book. I'm like, I know, because <laughs> that's not what life is yeah. about. Yeah, definitely. No, that's that's very cool. And sometimes <clears throat> I, I've, I've noticed that, that sometimes it's not the number of years that you're bringing to the table. Mm. It's very... I'd, shouldn't really say it's unfortunate but it's just strange that if you can't convey your idea your feelings to someone then there's really no point of the number of years that you have in your bag and that's very important to understand that as you move up in the corporate hierarchy you need to learn to present yourself to talk and have a a validated confidence i would say mm. not a fake one like it should be based on something legit but that's way more important than anything else um Mohammed other other than that uh since you know we've talked about the cool things of Heathrow but I do understand that it's a field when you are on ground there's there's a there's a fair amount of stress as well mm. that you have to get everything done there might be multiple priorities that you're dealing with uh so in your opinion how do you handle stress or over time is there a re- remedial scheme that you've mustered up for yourself to you know have a peace of mind and keep going It's a good question. Um I think it's important to to remember what your job actually is and what sometimes people will send to you and tell you this is what your job is but in reality that's just them trying mm-hmm. to empty their own plate onto yours. You know, at one point I, I when yeah. I first joined this specific role, mm-hmm. I had 17 different projects mm-hmm. at once. that I was trying to juggle. Wow. Right? Okay. But I realized it wasn't because okay. my role was that vast. It's because when people come to me, I just say yes and take it on board. And I didn't know how to set the boundaries mm-hmm. of this is great. I know it needs doing, but currently I don't have the capacity. It will have to wait. I didn't know how to have those difficult conversations mm-hmm. to be able to 
maybe push something mm. six months because it doesn't need to get done right now. And right now my, my plate is full yeah. and if I take any more, it will just cause more stress. So I think a, a, a life hack you could say yeah. for, for remedy of stress is know how to have difficult conversations mm. when people are offloading stuff onto you that aren't really your responsibility. And you need to have the bravery and the guts to say, mm. sorry, but no, I can't, I can't do that right now. And also another thing that really, really helped is yeah. you, you, you tend to specifically if you're, if you're, you know, you're, you're new in the role and you're, you're trying to prove yourself. You kind of don't say you're stressed to your manager. You're trying to just deal with it. Mm -hmm. And you hide like how much is going on. But that's one of the, the, the most yeah. challenging and worst things that you can do because they won't know what's going through your mind. One of the, one of the best things that you can do is open up and be like, yeah, I, I really do I really I'm I can't cope at the moment because I have too much you know I'm I'm stretched beyond okay. limits mm -hmm. um and to be very open and vocal about how how you feel like you're you know cuz what's going to happen is if you have too much on your plate the output of your work is going to show that right you're not going to be able to produce your best work exactly. you're not going to be able to be as creative as you yeah. want to be you're not going to be able to do things as well as you want to do so if you have all mm -hmm. these different things going on you're going to produce mediocre work. And at the end of the year, they, they're mm -hmm. going to be like, well, you've done a lot of things mediocrely. But if you tell your manager, this is my priorities mm -hmm. are this, this, and this, and I want to make sure that I can, I can deliver on these priorities. To do that, I need to say no to this. Mm -hmm. I can't do this. This is not on what I am, mm -hmm. I am being, this is my, this is what I need to do. Of course, there will be elements where you add it onto it and, you can scope creep on your role and do a little bit here and a little bit here and help people out. But I think at some point you need to know where enough is enough and I can't take any more. And I actually have to just say, no, sorry. If you maybe come back in six months and maybe I'll have capacity right. then. Um, other than that, Mohammed, do you have any cool traditions at work within your team? Oh, cool traditions within our team. Mm -hmm. When someone retires, they usually give them like a, a light from the runway. Yeah. Or like a piece of a piece of the runway. Oh, okay. That was that was quite. Yeah. I remember one of our one of our managers retired yeah. once, and they literally gave him a chunk of the runway to take <laughs> with like with like a piece of like metal engraved <laughs> with his name on it. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, otherwise, like oh, nice. Okay. Cool traditions. Yeah. That's a really good question. Give me give me a cool mm -hmm. tradition in your work. For sure. Uh, so er Ericsson is a Swedish company mm -hmm. and over there uh, they have this thing called Fika, F-I-K-A. Yeah, I know Fika. Um, what it essentially means is that, yeah, you have uh, a coffee break at work, but you do not talk about work. Mm. It's meant for you to mingle with other people, mm. to, to get to know them better. I mean, that's how I've perceived it here at North America because, of course, now it's not the exact same as they were to have it in Sweden but it's a cultural derivative of that here. So like we have once a week uh, for like 30 minutes, we, our team meet, meets up, uh, we bring food, we bring, we have coffee together and whatnot. And we just talk to them as friends, as humans, not as coworkers or managers and whatnot. And I think if, if you treat it as a business meeting, I think that's not a good thing. Treat it as an opportunity to get to know someone better. I mean, how else in the world are you ever going to get an opportunity, a free ride, basically, to get to know the VP of a company, right? They don't know you. You can just go to their, that team's speaker and just start talking to them, right? Uh, that's uh, that's an example that I can quickly think of from, from work. Uh, I think the beauty of that so, is yeah. it highlights <laughs> the importance of like speaking to people as people. Yeah. Yeah, we're not we're not all our job yes. titles. Yeah. We're so much more. Like you know, I'm sure. Like yeah, when you when you when you when you yeah. got married and you went home when when you went back to work, like you know, I'm sure they were asking you about mm -hmm. how it happened and what happened. And it wasn't any. It wasn't because you, you know you are at that point Osama, not your job role, not anything. You're a human being who's going through change in their life, and they're just curious yeah. and they want to learn about it. And I think that is such an important thing to remember. Exactly. That's such an important thing to remember. I mean, I have a personal tradition that's happening at the moment at work. I'm spending each of my okay. run, each of, every birthday, every time it's my birthday, I'm on the runway Yeah. as it ticks over. Uh -huh. So when, when it ticks onto my birthday, I'm okay. standing on the yeah. runway and I've just, yeah. I've kept it up for two years now. We'll see what the next year, <laughs> if I'll do the same for next year.
if I were to ask you about our formal education system, mm. uh, how do you think it has, or how would you comment on the situation right now that is it being able to produce quality and competent people in a way that they're not just technically well-versed, but they are able to communicate effectively as well. So in your personal journey, how do you think formal university education has helped you into being the person you are today? I'll be honest with you. I don't think it does enough to to highlight the importance of the mm-hmm. people skills. Um, it focuses far yeah. too much on the academic path. And I think it's interesting, right? We mm-hmm. tend to have this perception that to succeed, you need to go to university. Um, but it's getting a university yeah. degree is great, but it doesn't teach you anything about the real world. Nothing. It's a bubble. Yeah, you don't know. Mm-hmm. You don't learn much yeah. about how to succeed in the real world and i think that's something it really does an injustice Mm -hmm. with it teaches you a a great amount Mm -hmm. if you wanted to become an academic right if you wanted to actually go down the academia Mm -hmm. route but when you hit the real world you realize there's so much stuff that it doesn't teach you i think in general outside of university what education Mm -hmm. doesn't teach you is actually about things like you know how do money how does money work how does how does taxes work like what's a mortgage like life skills exactly. right actually actual things that are yeah. going to benefit you how do yeah. you have a conversation with somebody yeah. and build a connection with them how do you how do you ask mm-hmm. open questions instead of closed questions because closed questions will limit how much information you're being told yeah. you know these things mm-hmm. are what really yeah. unlock life on another level not if you know how to solve a yeah. quadratic equation right yes yeah, solving a quadratic equation is great because it gets your mind to think in a in a problem solving way and i and i and i i completely yeah. understand that but i think there's so much that education yeah. system doesn't teach us and yeah. it really puts us on a back foot if you think yeah. that you're ready for the world just because you have a degree yeah absolutely and another example i can quickly think of from my my life is that it's more of a reflection i would say uh, once i was just sitting uh in my balcony and i was thinking that let's say if i were to run into uh, a legal problem in my my life just as an example right how do i hire a lawyer mm. all i know is that from movies whenever somebody is running into a problem lawyers just show up show up from thin air yeah. right? <laughs> so i've been thinking about that what if in school they could teach you that how to access the legal system of a country yeah. uh if you were to go to police for a problem how do you tell them what happened? What are they going to ask you about? Um, what your rights are, what your rights, yeah. Exactly, what are your rights as a citizen, right? Speaking of ideas, there's one thing I wanted to add on to, on to this yeah. element of the conversation, which was uh-huh. one other thing that they don't teach us in school is how to think, right? And actually, what, what are our thoughts and yeah. what are the boundaries that we can create in our own mind, Okay. Yeah, we 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 get yeah. taught as a young as a young person how to look after our teeth, right? How do you look after your teeth? You need to brush two yeah. minutes in the morning yeah. and two minutes at night. Why? Because yeah. your teeth are a vital part of your life, so that you can so that you can eat, so that you can do stuff. Mm. Right? It's an important part of your life. You need to have healthy teeth. Yeah. What do we teach? Yeah. What do they teach us about having mm. a healthy mind? What do they teach us about? looking after our mind and maintaining our mind mm. right we take our car to the mot yeah. like in, in the uk we mm. have the mot you have to mm-hmm. take your car for a service every year change the oil change this change that yeah. but we don't get taught how to even mm. look after our own brain and i think that's a massive flaw because this is the operating system yeah. for your whole life this thing that's right between your ears and if you don't get taught how to use it yeah, it's like not knowing how to use yeah. any tool. You'll just you'll just fumble your way mm-hmm. through life and think you, think you know what you're doing when you don't. But I think if we get taught how to use our yeah. brain, that can unlock so much potential. Hundred mm. um, percent. One of my friends who unfortunately passed away a few months ago was very dear to me, and he used to say the exact same thing that just like we care about our body and everything else in life, our mind is very essential. That if you can sustain the ability of thinking right. Um, that's a very essential trait that's going to help you, again, keep sane and keep happy and keep yourself satisfied mm. uh, overall in life. Um, that is that is definitely important. Uh, Mohammed, other, other than that, um, 
I was uh, very inspired when I read about you that uh, you've been a speaker at TEDx as well. Uh, so how did that event happen for you? And how was how was it like being a speaker at such a such an event? So one thing they don't tell you about TEDx talks is you have to apply. No one no one taps you on the shoulder and says, come speak at TED. Yeah. If you want a TEDx talk, for anyone listening, you okay. actually apply. You find, you find mm. one that's up and coming and then you go mm. and apply for it. Honestly, I love, one thing I discovered about myself mm. a few years ago is that I love conveying ideas. Mm. I love taking an idea and then building mm. an image of some in somebody else's mind that can allow them to understand what you mean and like understand that idea and draw that yeah. picture where they can stand back in their own brain mm. and be like, wow, that's a powerful idea. Mm -hmm. So the whole concept of TED yeah. and TEDx is ideas worth sharing. So mm -hmm. ever since I was young, I yes. have a, have, a, I have yeah. one of my notebooks from when I was mm -hmm. 19 years old. I wrote in that I want to have a TEDx mm -hmm. talk before the age of 25. At the age of 24, I applied to okay. be a TEDx speaker yeah. and I got accepted for my idea. And I went on there. And I shared, I shared some, I shared something that was extremely dear to my heart, which has nothing to do with aviation or engineering, uh, but it was actually about vulnerability mm -hmm. uh, and the power of vulnerability in the journey yeah. of, in the journey of of life and in the journey of expression. There is a moment where you need to have your cards yeah. on show and be as vulnerable as you can, because only then you're mm -hmm. demonstrating your true self. Uh, so I, I drew an image of what that means to me in the minds of the listeners. And I, and I loved it. Absolutely loved yeah. it. Um, so extending um, that idea a little forward, uh, in terms of core values, uh, what's something that's very dear to you that you uphold in your life uh, as well as in your professional journey as well? <sighs> Where do you start? <laughs> I think that one, th where, one, thing that, <laughs> one thing that's truly, truly important for me personally is treating people the way that I would want to be treated and actually connecting with mm -hmm. individuals and people. I think that the, the human beings that we meet are so dear and valuable as human beings first before anything, mm -hmm. they deserve the, the, the yeah. time, the energy they deserve being yeah. invested into and, you know, as our prophet says, you know, even a smile mm. is a form of charity because it really can change someone's life. So leaving a positive 100%. impact in every single part of my life is something that I'm really, really, is really dear to my heart. Where if, whether I'm, whether I'm in the street and I see, I see a branch that's on the ground, I'll try to pick it up and get it out of people's mm. way. Whether I'm at work and I see somebody who, who may be going through something that's challenging, I'll try and ask, I'll try and make time to make people feel special, I think that we underestimate mm. how much of an impact these small interactions when you give somebody all of your attention and all of your thought yeah. and your and your presence, these things go so far. So that's one thing that yeah. I try and stick to as much as I can. So in your opinion, uh, what does success mean to you? I think success is based upon and this is something i learned recently success is mm -hmm. only known at your funeral success is mm -hmm. the conversations that are being had the day you've gone and about what you left behind and the impact that you had on the world and that can be on the smallest scale or yeah. it can be on the biggest scale right do the people do the people mm -hmm. miss you because you were so yeah. loving, kind, caring, and giving? Were you the, did you live your life giving or did you live your life taking? Genuinely, I I when I reflect on it, Absolutely. success is success is when you when you're gone. What do the people say about about you? Um, and I and the re that the way I yeah. I learned that was was when my grandfather passed away. I never grew up Sorry with my grandfather. Yeah. I grew up in London and my grandfather was in Iraq. And he and I used to hear all about him. Mm. He used to be the leader of his of his local mosque. And he also used to be a representative of mm. one of the one of the um grand ayatollahs in Iraq. Now, I hear about him, right? I'm living in mm. London, he's living in Iraq. We're quite far removed. I went to visit him in a hospital in Syria before yeah. he passed away and I was there 12 days before he passed away. 
I got to sort of spend some real quality yeah. time with him. And it's just a one-to-one interaction, right? You only see him as your granddad. When I got yeah. back to London and he passed away, yeah. and I heard the news of his passing away, I booked a flight to go to Iraq for his burial. And mm-hmm. when I arrived to his city, I saw that people had put banners in the street with his pictures up, saying, Oh, father of the orphans, you mm-hmm. will be missed. And I saw grown men crying because they're going to miss him so much and how much of an impact he used to have. And I saw an entire community. We're talking 20 buses full of people who came to his funeral and then traveled with us across Iraq to go to his Mm -hmm. burial. I saw women, children. I saw grown men. I saw an entire, an entire community that, that was, that, that felt like their father was Mm -hmm. missing. And that's when I realized what success means. Yeah. Like my father left behind, had such an impact in his life that when he, when he was gone, yeah. he left a, a vacant hole in the hearts of the people who knew him. And that, that was a life changing moment for me because it yeah. made me realize how important that is. And especially after my friend Safter, he passed away. Mm. That's what I realized is, as well, that it's about how you made other people feel when you were alive, when you were around them. That's what matters the most. And that's what what has helped me to shift my perspective as well, that other than just chasing things, it's very important that when we, when, that when we are with someone, we should make them feel happy. We should make them feel valued, mm. uh, especially more than anything else. And I would rather take that take that analogy and apply it to our parents as well, that when we're around them, we should definitely try and, and make sure that they're happy and th- that they feel valued around us. And they just, you know, at that at the moment when, when you're together, they should just be at peace. Their hearts should be at peace. Um, that's that's something very important that I've come to real come to realize. And you know, as I'm growing older as well, you know, <laughs> these kind of things. <laughs> you know they they kind of take over you <laughs> not not in a negative way but it's like you start thinking about these things more than uh more than just engineering as well uh anyways uh the conversation is getting a little emotional here <laughs> let's get back on track <laughs> um Muhammad, now now that we are uh, reaching towards the end of our conversation um i want to ask you about your yourself as a as a as a person, as a human being, other than titles, what's something that genuinely makes you happy? My nephews and nieces. I'm an uncle of eight. And Cute. when whenever <laughs> they're home, yeah, I feel so loved mm-hmm. and I feel so appreciated. Mm-hmm. Like when I come home from work, yeah, and I and they hear the door open, yeah, and they hear that, yeah, like let's say they're all upstairs, and then. One of my sisters will say, mm-hmm. Khalu's home, like, you know, uncle's home. There's like yeah. a stampede down the stairs yeah. of all of them coming down yeah. to like, just, nice. just give me a hug <laughs> and like kiss me. And like, honestly, it makes my yeah. eyes water just thinking about it because I love them yeah. so much and they love me so much. And like, yeah. I, I'm like, I, when, I, when I'm with yeah. them, I like throw them in the air and I'm like a, I'm like mm-hmm. a human roller coaster, right? Yeah. I like, I play with them. Yeah. I don't buy them gifts. I just give them my nice. love. Like I, I give yeah. them my energy and yeah. my time. And, and I love that. And honestly, my family makes me feel yeah. so loved. Uh, and specifically when I, when mm-hmm. I have time to spend with my nephews yeah. and their nieces while they're young, it, it puts a massive smile on my face. Yeah. Nice. Ab- absolutely nice. Um, other than that, I've come to a realization after this conversation that you're definitely a man of great depth. Um, how did you develop that realization in life? And uh, how did you uh, carve that personality out for yourself over time? I read some good books and I had some great conversations uh-huh. with some great people. You know, I I, I want, mm. I want to, to, to feel life. I want to explore life. I think, I think quite deeply about things yeah. um, because I feel like that's where, that's where the richness of life is, right? You know, like life has a has a rich, mm-hmm. a real richness to yeah. it. And sometimes it's not, you yeah. can't feel that at the surface. You need to learn to yeah. internalize things and connect the dots. Um, so when I started to, to learn about yeah. 
the human soul when I started to learn about us as human beings and how the pursuit of life is to carve the most perfect and authentic soul you have no choice but to be deep when mm-hmm. you're having a conversation about the soul you know and I, and I love having those conversations yeah. and I love yeah. discussing and dissecting these things because um, because I feel like it, it makes yeah. me more whole it makes me more whole nice nice um, so Mohammed uh, let's uh, let's end our conversation at this point that um, if you were to solve a global issue if let's say you've been given a superpower and you were to solve one global issue uh, what is it going to be a lack of self-belief I would I wish I could remove mm-hmm people's perceptions of themselves that are negative and i wish i could make every single person believe that they are put on this earth for a truly truly significant reason <clears throat> and the world would be mm-hmm. incomplete without them pursuing that i wish every i wish i could make everyone wake yeah. up in the morning and feel like wow this world uh-huh. needs me and i am not insignificant i am i have this i have uh you know as you know in the quran allah says he he's blown his his ruh his soul into us right we are like a manifestation of god on earth and if only i can make i wish i could make mm-hmm. people feel that in the morning and remove that negative self belief mm-hmm. i feel like you don't even know what the upper limits of the world could be if we all woke up like that right that's very beautiful uh mohammed uh, thank you for sharing um it definitely gives me a perspective to reflect on my life as well and certainly i believe that um this conversation might help our audience to reflect uh individually as far as their lives are concerned and maybe make better conscious choices uh about themselves and and their loved ones um mohammed i truly truly appreciate you being here with us and sharing your time and sharing your wisdom with us here um i wish you nothing but success happiness Likewise. and contentment in your life um and with that we let's uh let's wrap up the conversation here as far as our audience are concerned if you like the conversation please feel free to like share and subscribe and um do share it with your friends and family uh we would definitely love to hear about the feedback that you might have and if there there were to be any guest recommendations do let us know in the comments as well um before the next episode rolls out or as the next uh, next episode is rolling out uh, you know do check us out on other uh, streaming platforms as well uh, and uh, with that i'll be signing off take care of yourselves and uh, see you in the next episode bye